Hell doesn't exist. It was made to scare you. Be free and know God is love and there is grace for you. Ooh. Hey. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. No, that's a really important distinction because I think it has to be um, very clear. And I know even in, in the run up to tonight, you and I were talking about, you know, I've been called and even you, which is even crazier, been called liberal and conservative almost in the same day. But it's very like my goal is truth. Your goal is truth. And mm -hmm. that means attacking this position because it's antithetical to the gospel. Then that's what we do. Whoever says it. And so mm -hmm. but but I you think know, it's very important that what you said, that the attack is against maybe attack is the wrong word, but the attack is against a, a different gospel, not against a group or a person or, or a church or something like that. And the reason being obviously that you want truth. That's right. And I yeah. think that's exactly why I, you know, cause when I was addressing the movement in the beginning, I thought, well, I have to come up with what the opposite is. Well, is the opposite evangelical? Well, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. That that could go off the rails. We don't know. Uh, yeah. Is it Protestant? Well, no, it's not really Protestant. What I wanted to do was go back to the earliest definition of what Christianity is. How did Jesus define it? How did the earliest apostles, the early church fathers, define the gospel yeah. and trace that through church history? And of course, I have opinions on Protestant and evangelical and all that. Right. Um, but but I want to defend against progressive Christianity, I want to defend historic Christianity, not necessarily some kind of bubble I grew up in, because I had to sort of go back and see, well, what about what I was raised with is actually authentic Christianity and what isn't, yeah. and then sort of get rid of the stuff that isn't authentic Christianity and embrace the stuff that is. And maybe there's some things that I didn't know about as I was growing up that uh, define Christianity and have made has made it unique in the world for 2000 years. And so uh, that that's sort of why I chose that as as the the opposing view rather than fighting for some kind of modern label we're just talking about bare bones core christianity here like the gospel right yeah. there are secondary issues i'm sure you and i disagree about yeah. but we're talking about like are are we brother and sister in christ and we're mm -hmm. brother and sister in christ we can argue about those other things you know throughout our lives we can argue about them in heaven but what <laughs> really matters i mean the core issues of what it means to be saved what it means to call yourself a jesus follower and that's what i that's what I chose to try to defend in, yeah. in my opposition to progressive Christianity. How we got into this, how we got here, was um, somebody posted a very interesting TikTok video from a progressive Christian. And for the record, me and Alex are not progressive Christians. I just want to put it out there, right? Um, <laughs> nobody, in fact, in the UA community are progressive Christians. <laughs> nobody, in fact, in the UA community are progressive Christians. We are definitely not that, you know, um, we are not on the wrong side of woke. And um, <laughs> the reason why I bring it up right up front is because I think a lot of people see us and think we're them. Mm -hmm. How they do that, I don't know. We all try to be as sound as possible about doctrine, but we are we are very grounded in the essentials. What is some of the pushback that you've maybe got from your book? that you got from your blog. I know you got a lot of positive things, but what is some of the pushback from the progressive Christian mm. sect or and on whatever we want to call it um, that maybe even shocked you or that was missing the point of which you were trying to articulate? Yeah, thanks for that question. That's a good question. And I think to maybe to properly understand where the pushback is coming from, it might do us good to go a little bit further into defining it because you know we talked about the kind of the fundamental difference in the way we see church history as far as the people closest to Jesus. And by the way, I, I want to say this from the get-go. To say the phrase progressive Christianity or progressive Christian, this is not a derogatory term. This isn't some sort of slanderous term I made up to bash people I disagree with. This is actually a term that they use to describe themselves. Yep. They define progressive Christianity themselves. And I do my best to represent their views accurately so that, you know, if there's something I disagree with, I make sure that I'm disagreeing with what they actually believe. And I really yeah. do my best, the best of my ability to do that. And so if we look at the way progressive 
progressive Christians define it, what you're going to see is if you follow the narrative arc of the gospel, just I'm talking bare bones. I'm not going to get into secondary issues here. But if yeah. we think about you know, creation, uh, humans created in the image of God, and then humans choose to rebel against God, introducing sin into the world. Of course, God being holy, this separates uh, sinful humanity from a holy God. So we have a big problem here. And then Jesus comes with the rescue plan, God in flesh, living this sinful life, taking our sins upon himself on the cross, making uh, cleansing us from our sins, offering us that redemption. And then for those who choose to put their trust in Jesus, you have eternity with God, eternal life in heaven with God. And for those who don't want to be with God forever, there's this place called hell. And, and so this is kind of like the bare bones Christian gospel. But on every point, uh, as, as far as I can tell from all of the progressive literature that I have read and the blog posts I've read, the podcasts I've listened to, there is almost a unanimous uh, sort of denial of all of these things. So in in the progressive church, they they don't believe that sin separates us from God. They believe that it's just our shame. If we just mm. were to realize how beloved we are and how beautiful we are, we would realize we were never separated with God from God in the first place. Now, of course, if that's your your sort of uh, soteriology or your theology of salvation, then you don't really need atonement. And so you can see why that would be something that would be viewed kind of ugly and horrific. And you'll often hear the atonement referred to as cosmic child abuse in the progressive church. And then, of course, there's this universalist sort of tendency to deny this final judgment in heaven and hell. You know, just in the end, it's going to be fine. We don't know exactly what heaven is, but everybody's going to be there and it will be okay. There is no hell. And, and of course, not every progressive Christian is going to do that narrative arc exactly like that. But the thought leaders, the ones writing the books, generally speaking, that's been my experience is that's where they're coming from is denial of all of those kind of core gospel points. And so so to answer your question about the pushback, um, it, it's very interesting to me, the pushback that, that I've gotten. I've gotten a, a few different sort of types of pushback. Yeah. I would say the main one would be uh, just this sort of like, oh, you're so close-minded, um, you're, you're just bigoted and hateful because you don't want people to sort of experience God for themselves, and um, you, you, you're you stuck in this sort of really simplistic evangelical idea, and once you really get it, once you do the work, you'll understand that God is so much bigger than the tiny little box you're trying to put him in. I think that's probably the main uh, pushback I get, but I, I do see a lot of progressive Christians saying things like, well, that I just don't understand progressive Christianity. Um, but but what interesting, what I haven't seen a whole lot of is people refuting the points. Um, very often when I listen yeah. to critiques, they'll say, well, I agree that this is what progressive Christians believe, but I just, you know, I, th I think that it's silly to still think this way or something like that. So, I, I mean, I definitely do get a lot of pushback, but yeah. like you said, I think that um, what keeps me encouraged is the emails I get from people daily who say, man, exactly what you're describing is what I'm seeing happen in my church. And yeah. I'm so thankful that I have language now for to to give, you know, words to my red flags. And so that that, that keeps me encouraged. So his name is, you know, he calls himself Reverend Brandon Robertson, author, activist, theologian. I want, one could argue that. <laughs> um, and you can see this, you know, the signs right next to him. Interesting what he puts first. But I need I, I, I peep that to just now. Yeah. So that's interesting. So let's learn a little bit more about Mr. Robertson, the theologian. Now, let's learn a little bit about his schooling. He went to... Right. Um, What's it? How do you say this? It's I live. I live. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Theological school related to the United Methodist Church. Its central mission is the education of persons for effective ministry in Christian churches and other religious communities for academic leadership and for the cultivation of justice and peace in local and global contexts. I live affirms its United Methodist identity and its liberal Christian heritage, grounded in scriptures question mark, <laughs> provided by Alex, uh, <laughs> and traditions, critical thinking, interesting, <laughs> and openness to emerging truths, including those derived from, so from science, experience, and other faith traditions. Interesting. In a world fragmented by religious and ideological conflicts, ILIF promotes theological scholarship and dialogue to foster 
transformative possibilities for humanity and nature. Jesus wasn't very concerned with believing the right thing. He wasn't even concerned with making others Christians. He wasn't even a Christian. <laughs> for him, it was about a compassionate way of living. All that Christians would be more like Christ. Okay, so this is this is not even a theological issue. This is a grammatical issue. <laughs> And I've heard atheists make this claim, but I've never heard a Christian pastor of all things make this claim. It's illogical on the face of it. The suffix, I can't believe I'm teaching English class right now. The suffix I-A-N right. means relating to, belonging to. Right. 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 So if I am a Martian, I am from Mars. Right. That's what the that's what that word means. So Christ, by definition, could not be a Christian because he can't be of himself. Right. It's illogical to even say we're trying to be like him. He right. doesn't have to try. He already is. He already is. Right. <laughs> if if we're going to say that I can be this way or that I decide who I am or how I am, then you're also saying that God made a mistake. And if God is capable of error, he's no longer God. So if you feel like I'm in the wrong body or I am, this is the best expression of myself. You can say that, but you can't say that and claim Christ. You see what I'm saying? You can't have you can't have it both ways. Either he is right and he doesn't make mistakes. And then, then it's up to us to seek him and figure out, God, help me understand how you design me and why you design me in such a way and help me align as best as possible with your standard and your word and your nature. And that, I'm not saying it's not a struggle. It might very well be a struggle. We all in some way struggle to align with Christ in general. All of us do. That's just the one that gets the most publicity. Hey, grace and peace be unto you from God, our father and our mother and our mother and our mother and Jesus Christ, our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, our returning redeemer, Pastor Howard John Wesley. And I'm grateful that you've taken time out on a Tuesday night to join us in a different kind of Bible study called Can I Push It? But but the other problem with this whole progressive idea is it's arrogant. So so they they couch it in this idea of um, let's all get along type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually very arrogant because you're saying that the church fathers of the first, second, and third century and all of Jesus's direct disciples they didn't understand what Jesus meant. But now, two thousand years later, you're here to help us understand it <laughs> because the truth just emerged. Just right, now. right. <laughs> Hell doesn't exist, it was made to scare you. Be free and know God is love and there is grace for you. Here, let's play that again. <laughs> Hell doesn't exist, it was made to scare you. Be free and know God is love and there is grace for you. All right. Should we reverse engineer that? Because... He mentions grace, mm. right? Why would you need grace? <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> if there's something that you, you know, like what? Well, anyway, you, you go, you go. No, nah, I mean, that's it. This is the kind of um, verbal linguistics you have to do when, when you come with your presupposition to the text. This is what you have to do. And, and like you said, the the wording the the word itself doesn't even make any sense at that point the, the the reality is very easy on this jesus believed hell was a real thing a real place so am i am i once again telling jesus <laughs> he got it wrong well like, you know jesus wasn't concerned about the truth alex so you know oh yeah my, my bad i forgot <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just take let's just take his name you know yeshua if you want so it's it's not like alex McElroy is jesus christ it wasn't first, last name, Jesus, that word, that name means something. Christ means something. Jesus means the Lord saves. So the question very quickly is, what are we being saved from? Saved from what? Saved from what? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, once again, it becomes arrogant. So once you say, okay, I, all these different, this, this whole synchronistic, pluralistic thing, once everything is valid, well, if you're a Christian saying this, that's that's very arrogant and it's very insulting to Jesus because you're saying when Jesus was sweating drops of blood and and thinking like, man, if there was any other way, I, I don't want to do this. It's going to hurt. 
Well, don't you think if there was another way, he would have done it? <laughs> like he went to the cross after getting beat because there's no other way. And so you can't call yourself a Christian and say, yeah, I'm glad he did that. But, you know, I can all, I can just go to the Namaste conference and that that helps, too. <laughs> <laughs> it. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit has personality and you are biblically correct to refer to the Holy Spirit as her and she. And so throughout this sermon, I'm trying to intentionally use gender equal language to remind you that God is not a person, which means that God is not a man, which means that we should not limit our understanding of God to masculine language. For if the truth be told, women are shaped and formed in the image of God. And when you embrace femininity, you are also embracing the homoousios of God. There ought to be a sister wave a hand right here somewhere that we should not just equate God's strength and power with masculine language. For there's some sisters in here who know that there's some femininity that is powerful. As a matter of fact, if you've ever given birth, you know that there's a strength in femininity that a man can never understand. I wish I had some sisters that know that to be a woman is to be strong. To be a woman is to embody the essence of God. To be a woman is to walk in the power of God. And that when we talk about God, we can talk about her because that's where you find the real strength and love of God. Yeah, we are a progressive church. Ooh. Hey, let's see what did. Okay, we already know the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as he, right? That's where he has a problem with it. So he's disagreeing with the Bible. I hope y'all caught that. But let's just look at some of the some of the other historians, theologians throughout the years, throughout the centuries. Let's go to Tertullian, 213 AD. This is pre nicene right? But the paraclete, who is to call the Holy Spirit, is so called from his work of consolation. I went now, I think this is from against Praxius, but this is 213 AD. Okay. Let's go forward. 1529 AD, Luther, the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel and illuminated me with his gifts, his gifts, and sanctified and preserved me in the true faith. Okay, so far so good. Schleiermacher. Now, I did this just for you, Zion. <laughs> but I'm going to say something in a second. This is 1830, roughly. The spirit of God in the hearts of the disciples ought to be a continuous hearing, a continuous attending to what the Lord himself had said to them when he was with them. For these phrases belong together. He, Jesus, and I'm sorry, he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine, Jesus, two distinct persons within the Godhead and declare it to you. And whatever he, the Holy Spirit, hears, he will speak, right? So now we get up to, well, I think that clips from 2017. And so now all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's a she? How, how did that happen? And, and the arrogance that I'm speaking to is the fact that from the beginning, from the people that literally walked with Jesus up to the people who are next in line, the patristics and going all through the Reformation and going up. And, and this is why I brought Schleiermacher. Let me tell you, Schleiermacher is considered the father of progressive or liberal theology or Christianity. He wouldn't probably have characterized himself in that way. But most theologians trace that kind of mindset back to him. And so, so this is a liberal dude saying this, and he's still calling the Holy Spirit he. And I'm trying to drive this point because anybody who is saying anything other than that, you're standing on the outside looking in, Mr. Wesley and others. Yes. There is no one in the history of the church that co-signs that. So the arrogance comes in with saying, OK, well, I know y'all were thinking one way. I know I know for 2000 years y'all thought you had it right. But we've progressed. I've progressed. Let me bring you where I am. Let me bring you where God's got me. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? That the, the, the arrogance within there is that somehow we need to uh, step our game up to you. All right. <clears throat> so it says, for when it is the good that is under construction, I'm sorry, consideration, um, and the ethical object is predominant, truth must be considered more in reference to art than science. For that is unity is to be, I'm sorry. If that is unity is to be preserved in the work generally. 
what do you what do you want to say on that? And then we'll throw some other thoughts in there. Well, I mean, this this is a this is a very sly mocking quote. It's very consistent with his uh, line of thinking. For those who don't know, just a little back vibe. Yeah. It, at Slymarker's time, the Enlightenment philosophers that had come before him, Enlightenment conversation was very popular. It was the hip thing in wealthy, affluent circles. The upper echelon of society enjoyed feeling and, and being erudite and being in the know. And so philosophers were rock stars. I mean, it, at the turn of the 20th century, when you come, come into World War II, right before World War II, Karl Barth is a Karl Barth, Albert Einstein, Dizzy Gillespie, not Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Louis Armstrong, are three of the biggest rock stars on the planet. To kind of give you a, a, some context compared to what we see today, you know, today Cardi B is a rock star. So <laughs> that's kind of where the society's gone. Yeah. But anyway, but what was happening, Sly Mocker, as that circle, that that group of society was leaving the church. Had been leaving was leaving. Slymark is a rock star in Germany. He is a huge, powerful preaching pastor there in Germany. And Slymarker sees what's going on because he's invited to erudite dinners and whatnot, and he's hearing. And Slymarker really thought that he was helping to save Christianity. And when you read this statement, you're getting kind of where his 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 thought led. Pay attention to just key terms he says. He says, "For when it is good, uh, it, when it is the good that is under consideration." considering the good this is the good of society the good of all is along the lines of the thinking and the ethical object is predominant what is ethical what is right truth must be considered more in reference to art this is very art is what subjective science is what absolute to this point do you want to go to a postmodern surgeon or do you want to go to a modern surgeon do you want a, sur a surgeon who has who went to art school and has never cut anybody and let them perform on you? Or do you want someone who went to medical school and has already done successfully a hundred surgeries before you? Yeah. This is the contrast. And here's the key word. Look at what he says, this conditional term, if. If that is, unity is to be preserved in the work generally. This was all of his, this was at the real root of why Steinmarker came up with this emotive hermeneutic where he told that group, you don't have to leave church. You just can now, you are free to interpret the faith from the perspective of your feelings. And so that's why when you read this statement and he says, if that is unity is to be preserved, then for Slymarker to preserve unity, that was his goal. Right. Truth was not the goal, preserving right. unity. So for Slymarker to preserve unity, I'm gonna give everyone license to be in the church and make everything else up as you go. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this is, it is, it's baffling how he came to this while reading scripture. I mean, it's just, I don't know how you, how you do that. Because when we read about Jesus, when we read about Paul, when we look at persecution in the first two centuries, what Slymark is saying is completely antithetical. Jesus never prioritized patronizing and appeasing anyone. Yeah. He told the truth and kept it moving. He even so, went so far as to tell, tell the disciples at the time, go from town to town. And if they don't receive you, they don't receive the word, kick the dust from your heels and keep moving. He doesn't say, say whatever you have to say to get them to be agreeable. What we see with liberalism is the same thing we see in common with atheism. And that is, I don't like what Christianity is saying but Chris, because Christianity is condemning or rejecting uh, some truth that either I or someone I know and love is practicing. Right. He had this term, uh, I forget how to pronounce it, gufoil, gufoil or something like that, some German term. It means it means a feeling. And, and there's a lot of different ways you can use it because it's not, I don't think it's a word he made up. But um, Quentin said, uh, but of course, you can't have unity without truth. And this is actually what I was thinking as you were talking, because if we're on, if we're on a team, right, we can't each have our own truth and call ourselves unified. <laughs> we can't each we can't each think we're the superstar like like Charles Barkley always talk about the role players. If all of us think we're the star, we ain't gonna be unified, <laughs> and we're not gonna win either. So we that's a great, we, point. Uh, that's a great point, right? So we got to have clarity on. Um, now I don't know I don't always agree with Ben Shapiro, but one thing I do agree with is when he says um, facts don't care about your feelings, and that's true. That's true. I mean, so so like I said, y'all. It's not about liberal, it's not about conservative. Let me start here. 
um, in the opening of that section, it's quite interesting because in one hand, uh, he appears to um, confess classical Trinitarianism. But at the opening, it's quite clear that his conceptualization of God is modalistic. He specifically right. said the classical definition of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which he says uh, is what is classically referred to as the Trinity. He says, but the better way to see it, which really pushes upon uh, what you were just saying, uh, Alex, that uh, progressive or liberal theology is super arrogant. Uh, it, it literally rejects not only all of the revelatory data that we have from the text, but the historical ways in which the church understood it completely deviates from it uh, upon this assumption that we're smarter now. So the better way, he says, to see it is not to see God as three uh, individual persons. And I take individual as his way of saying distinct. But that is how you understand the Trinity, is to understand God in that kind of complexity as eternally existing in three distinct persons. For Wesley, that's not a better way to do it. Then he proceeds to say the better way to understand God is to understand God functionally, to understand God uh, as creator and understand him as redeemer and to essentially understand him as, I think it was comforter or something of the other uh, when he referred to the Holy Spirit. But this is classic modalism. And so it's important to understand that what, what Wesley does here is he removes the understanding of distinct persons, ways in which the Father identifies himself in distinction from the Son uh, and the Holy Spirit in distinction from the, the Father and the Son, so forth and so on, and reduces that to essentially uh, the economy of God, that is what God does, as opposed to who God right. is, right? right? And so once you have removed, once you have reduced the persons of God to mere functions, that's modalism, which essentially, essentially says that there's one God who expresses himself in three different modes. Sometimes he acts as the Father, other times he acts as the Son, and then at other times he acts as the Holy Spirit. When he is doing these kinds of things in creation as the Father, and it makes Scripture in incoherent as the Son, right. right, and then in regeneration as the Holy Spirit. That's just modalism, because at that point you really don't have relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit because our uh, roles don't engage with each other. You know, if, if I'm a painter, plumber, and an electrician, the painter right. doesn't engage with the plumber and the plumber doesn't engage with the electrician. Right. Those are just two different roles that I hold. And so what Wesley actually holds to is not Trinitarianism, it's a modalism, which really surprised me because I didn't know that until yeah. I heard him explain what he really truly believes about God. And this is not misspeak, folk, because he said it is not it, it is not helpful to understand God as three distinct persons, right. but rather to understand God as functions. Mm -hmm. Right. So 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 that was one of the things that immediately caught me. But he appears also to, to, to at first, if you're if you're not listen listening carefully, he appears to have an understanding of the word uh, homoousius and uh, hypostasis. But then he uh, demonstrates that he really doesn't understand what what homoousius means, uh, because homoousius, in fact, means the same substance. Right? What's this now? It means that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit share in the same substance or essence of being. That is what we call the isness of God. It's what it's what makes each three persons in the Godhead God. That is inseparable. It is indivisible. That is why they mutually penetrate each other in terms of what we refer to as the perichoresis. To prove that Mr. Wesley doesn't accept 
uh, this notion of uh, homoousius in terms of God's oneness as being one substance or one essence of being. He proceeds to suggest that not only is it proper for us to refer to the Holy Spirit as she, but he suggests that women share because they're women and for no other reason, but because they're women, Please, that right. they share in the homoousius of God. You know what that means? That means that we become part of God's own essence of being. That yep. literally makes women part of the Godhead. Mm. That makes us part of the Godhead. The, see, the, 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 the homoousius of God means not that they are the same persons, but that they share in the same essence of being. That is only shared by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. That one essence is not shared with anyone else. Right. To become a partaker of God's divine nature doesn't mean that we that we are brought into the homoousius. It means that in the regeneration, what the Holy Spirit does is develops the character of God in us, but it doesn't make us part of the Godhead. And so by Wesley's own logic and argument, women are by nature part of the homoousius of God on the basis of simply being women, because as he argues, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, can be referred to as she. And then he even it, at the very earlier part of the video says, God the Father and God the Mother. And so this is, uh -huh. make no mistake about it, this is rank heresy. This is rank heresy. This is rank heresy. Uh, this rank is heresy. tantamount to essentially calling people God. Because if we can, uh, if we can partake, that is become part of the homoousius of God, then we can actually consider ourselves to be God in the very same way that Jesus considers himself equal with the Father and the same way that the Holy Spirit considers his equality with the Son and with the Father. That is why they are co-equal, because they all share in the same essence and substance of being. By him referring to uh, hypostasis, it demonstrates that he confuses the terminologies because in reality, uh, in the classical language of the church, the hypostasis refers to the three persons in the Godhead, while the homoousius refers to the one essence that the three persons share. And so if he believed what those words meant as it relates to the Godhead, he would have never opened his argument up by saying the better way to understand God is not one God in three distinct persons, but rather one God who um, reveals himself in three different functions. So if he really understood hypostasis and homoousius, then his argument would not be Sabellian or modalistic. Man, well said, lot said there. Um. How do you view passages like John 14, 6, which says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12, which reads, and there is salvation and no one else for there is no other name under heaven um, given among men by which we must be saved. And lastly, Romans 5, 18, which says, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. So in light of your position, how how do you all um, approach those passages? Because I, I so for me, and I, I know this is where you know. I Listen to this explanation, y'all, because y'all was asking about, about him and his verses, this specific verse, John fourteen six, and others. Listen to what he says. The rub is because I, I was born, raised Baptist. John fourteen <laughs> six was right after John three sixteen. Yeah, you know, uh, right, uh, you, right. You learned them in that order. That's true. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the way it went, and you know, scholarship and learning challenges traditional understanding you know so I, what i accepted as a young child i then begin to question when this is exclusive to johannine literature mm -hmm. the john 14 6 not to say that if it was replete in all four gospels it holds more weight because i understand authorial intent 
I also understand that a lot of the speeches and acts are, if we want to attribute it to Luke, it's this prosopoeia. It's Luke putting speech in the mouth mm -hmm. of someone else to justify his thoughts. So this, I'm not saying that Peter doesn't say this, but this is Luke saying this is what <clears throat> Peter said. And Dr. Judy's helped me tremendously understand that you can really make the Bible say what you want the Bible to say. Mm -hmm. And when I incorporate passages like this with Abram arguing with God over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18, Abram lands where I do, which I think is an exclusive position. Mm -hmm. He says, surely the God of the universe will do what is right. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. it's not, I don't make that decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to. I don't, so to answer your question, Dr. Mentor, I don't have to preach about who's going to hell because that's what I stand against. I'm about how to be in right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to play judge of the universe. I'm not going to deal with who's going to hell. I'm advocating for the way that I know to be in right relation with God and therefore in relationship with humanity, which to me is through Jesus Christ, but also understanding that you can possibly be in right relationship with God and definitely be in right relationship with humanity in other forms and ways that call you to an ethical living um, that, that I have to embrace. Mm -hmm. So for me, one of the passages that's critical for me is in Acts 15, okay. when the church is arguing over Gentile circumcision, right? Peter and Paul going at it. And they did not have the debate simply saying, what did Moses say? They didn't just rely on scripture. Mm. They brought in personal experience. Paul argued for the validity of the Gentile experience, obviously through Jesus, but simply because of his exposure to them. Right, so he argues with Peter, not based on scripture, but what he's experienced. And it's difficult for me when my experience of others outside of Christ validates a relationship with God and with humanity that may stand contradictory to certain passages. I have to put more on the table than simply this verse, this verse, and this verse. Okay, Jesus, if we read the scripture and read his words, Jesus seemed to believe in hell. I believe Michelle just put a passage up there and I put it on the screen. Uh, I, like I said, it's very clear. I'm not sure how else to interpret this or if you need interpretation. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one, one who can destroy, who can do this. He's capable of this and put the body and soul in hell. So hell is an ontological reality. It is, I don't, I want people to get this kind of analogous or, or metaphorical, metaphysical, whatever you want to, whatever kind of pseudo reality that, that's, that seems to be popular in liberalism or progressivism, where the, the, the idea of hell is so uncomfortable that maybe that's not what it really is. Maybe that's not what he really meant. Right. And I get the uncomfortable aspect of it. I get it. And I get it so much that for a living, I do this. I don't want no one there. So I tell them the truth. So they won't go there. So I tell them the truth. So they won't go there. Do you see the point? Like he's cutting his own feet out from under him. If you don't want people to go to hell, then tell them how not to go. You don't, he said, I don't have to preach against hell because that's what I stand against. Okay. Let's, let's, tell the other ontological issue. He needs to take a philosophy class, I think. So the other issue is you say you you don't have to preach against hell because that's what you stand against, but you, you haven't defined anything you stand on. <laughs> so you can't define what hell is. So what are you talking about? You can't, you don't have to talk about it because you're because you're preaching against it. You're not preaching against it because you don't even know what it is. And you're and you're not preaching how to go to an actual place called heaven because you don't know that is or right. how to get there. You know, to say I don't need to preach against hell or because I stand against it, he stands against the idea of hell. He has no concept from my knowledge and from the stuff I've watched of actual hell. That's a difference. One of his hermeneutics, and when I say hermeneutic, everybody, I'm saying the lens through which or the the rules through which you examine life and form a worldview. He is saying this Muslim is a nice guy. I like him. He seems to be a good person. I'd rather worship with this person than somebody who theologically and spiritually is my brother or sister because they're not a nice person. Now, there's a lot of leaps. Every Christian's not mean. Of course there's some. I've probably been one. You know, like everyone is, we never claim perfection. 
but this has nothing to do with truth. There are ways, there are, there are tests for truth. Not that I admit it. Logical consistency, consistency is it experientially, re experientially relevant? Does this pass the test of the coherence theory of truth, the correspondence theory of truth? This is day one philosophy class. Exactly. Like correspondence theory and coherence theory is day one philosophy. It has to correspond to reality. It has to form a coherent worldview when all the propositions are put together. Every Everybody at this status at, at a doctor level should know that, especially in the pastorate. So he's missing that you don't like the idea of hell, but if you don't define your terminology, then you don't even know what you're preaching for or against. Right. Let me say this last thing. There has to be a telos. Um, and this is, so my shape, my channel is called Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. Purpose, you know, you can look at a tele teleology. That is design and direction. And those things are necessary in order for things, something to have meaning or purpose. A telos is also known as a, it can be considered a goal. It's, a, it's the direction we're heading. Now, when we watch basketball, it's March Madness. The goal, everyone knows the goal and knowing the goal makes it fun to watch. It makes it fun to play. If you're, if you're a player, Wesley has removed the goal. We talk about moving the goalpost. There's no goalpost. There's no target. These are, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is not a knock against him. There's nothing to aim for in his Christian worldview. What are we doing? What are we even here for? I feel like Jadakiss. What am I even doing here? I mean, come on, what are we doing here? I could have been in bed watching a honey guy. Right, right. Like, what's the point? There, there's, I, I have no moral responsibility to the dictates of the text. I have no obedience responsibility to Jesus. I can rename parts of the Godhead or portion, people of the Godhead the way I like. This is so barely Christian, if you even want to call it that, <laughs> that there is no target or goal. There's no good news left. Message. Do you see what I'm saying, y'all? Man, listen, there, there's so much to unpack. The, I think the first thing that I would want to attack is uh, first the way that he dichotomizes uh, between um, accepting the the words of Moses, the words of Paul, with with the life of Jesus. Right. Uh, essentially, all cults attempt to create this false dichotomy between Pauline literature and then the Gospels, mm -hmm. and they attempt to charge Christians with essentially believing Paul over Jesus, right? This is a super smoke screen. And, uh, and then doing so, they have theorized that essentially uh, what Christianity really is today is Pauline, that Paul literally developed a version of Christianity by pulling away ideas from the original form held by James and John and some of Jesus's other apostles. So in other words, uh, Paul's version of Christianity uh, looks very different from the original version that Jesus taught uh, the apostles. So this is kind of part of that theory uh, that it sounds like <clears throat> Wesley um, subscribes to. Th this notion that uh, what Christians believe today is really more, more Pauline then it is uh, gospel, which, um, you know, he would suggest reflects the life of Jesus, so forth and so on. But the interesting thing about the way that uh, Wesley articulates this is that even when you go to the gospel, so for instance, notice the scriptures that they asked him about. These were scriptures that specifically pointed to the um, exclusivity of Jesus and, and uh, Christianity. He resorted to essentially talking about the different types of speech acts in scripture and how this is an example of one person essentially saying that another person said it. So in reality, we can't trust it. Well, you got to throw so much of the Bible away then, <laughs> if that's the case. Right. So in reality, he really does subscribe to a, a an a la carte kind of pick and choose. Let me put this in my basket. Not this though. I don't like that. And, uh, but it makes sense why persons like Wesley do that. Paul wrote three fourths of the New Testament corpus. But what about the, uh, the one fourth? Is the one fourth divergent? Is it, does it disagree with what we read in Paul? Absolutely not. In fact, what we read in Paul is agreeable in the gospels. And what we read in Paul 
is also agreeable in the general epistles. And, and so there's a very there's a very strong cohesive thought in early Christianity. There is strong agreement about the essential matters of the Christian faith. For Wesley, he is more informed by what he considers scholarship. Uh, that he says, you know, traditional thinking or traditional Christianity. Uh, he talks about this dichotomy between that and scholarship. And so for Wesley, Christianity, as he believes it, is the result of scholarly or academic invention. It is not the result of what was held by the earliest Christian communities. These are the kind of things that Wesley thinks are unintelligent. These are the things that we need to get away from. And so he really insults, like he constantly makes reference to, well, you know, I grew up Baptist and and we believed like this. And he makes believing in a certain way sound so unintelligent. So for instance, here's one of the ways that he accomplishes that. He talks about this notion of, well, you know, people have attempted to make the Bible say whatever they wanted to say. He talks about how they weaponized it uh, to all kinds of evil and ungodly and so forth and so on. And that's true. But this is really a gross oversimplification. Oversimpl and I'm going to tell you why. It is not true, first of all, that you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Right. That, that's just not true. Uh, that that's that's an oversimplification of what is true. First of all, you can't make it say whatever it doesn't say. And second of all, you can't make it mean something that it doesn't mean. You can make a text up here to mean something that it doesn't, but you can't make it say something it doesn't, and you can't make it uh, mean something that it doesn't mean. That's number one. Number two, um, he doesn't do a, a, a great job drawing distinction between reading and interpretation. So he suggests that what we have been doing all this time is simply basing what we believe off of proof texting, simply reading a verse saying, here, this is the reason I believe this is, look, this is what it says in John 3 and 5. That's not what we've been doing. That's not what we've been doing. The way he's setting it up and framing it is really straw manning. He makes it seem like the way that we have arrived at what we believe is simply proof texting, which is essentially finding scriptures that you think supports a view that you hold when in fact that scripture does not support that view. That's how Wesley describes his Baptist up upbringing. And that's essentially how he describes <clears throat> Christianity as essentially just being good at proof texting because he says, well, you know what? We, we, we've, we've got to go beyond just saying the Bible says. <clears throat> well, what does he think we've been doing all these years? We're not just saying the Bible says. Exegesis is about explaining what the Bible says and drawing the meaning out. So <clears throat> let me give you an example. In uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, uh, verses 7 and 8, here's what it says. Uh, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and Peliah, who were Levites. Listen, it said they explained the law to the people gave as the they faith. stood in their places. They read out of the book of the law of God. So you've got reading there. They read out of the book of the law of God. Yep. It says translating and giving the meaning so that the people, watch this, could understand what was read. So they did three things. Number one, they read it. They read it in two different ways. They read it in its original Hebrew text, but because these were exilic Jews who had grown up in exile, that is in Babylon, they also read it in translation. This is where we ultimately get the tradition of the Targums from. They read it in Aramaic. It says they translated it. That's what mm -hmm. that means. But that would just be reading still. Mm -hmm. They go further from reading in Hebrew and then reading uh, essentially a, an Aramaic 
uh, a version of that same reading, it says that they go from there to give the meaning so that the people could understand what was read. Yeah. And, and, and so what Wesley is advocating for is not novel and it's not new. It's what we've been doing all the time. Only he wants to suggest that what we've been doing is just proof texting so that he can create this version of himself that seems to graduate from the ignorance and the, the dark ages of just reading scripture and coming up with conclusions based on what we've read. But that's really disingenuous. That's yeah. not what we've been doing at all. Now, and I'm not saying that they are not some who do that. Obviously, that would be a very fundamentalist approach. What we've been doing the whole time is reading the text and then explaining the various contexts that inform the meaning. So it seems like Wesley is claiming that, well, you know, I've grown and, you know, back then I used to do it this way, but now, well, that's the way we've been doing it all along. Mm. So why is he coming up with right. meanings that are so divergent from biblical orthodoxy? It's because in reality, what Howard John Wesley is really doing is creating his own rules for what orthodoxy is. He's attempted to suggest that there were various orthodoxies mm -hmm. uh, held by Christians, that they believed a lot of different things. Notice what he said about Thomas, that essentially what Thomas was really saying is just because uh, Peter believes a certain way doesn't mean that I have to believe that way, right? But if that were true, then why was Arius considered a heretic, mm. right? Why was he considered a heretic by the early church? Was it because he simply believed differently from mm -hmm. everybody else? Or was it because his beliefs actually deviated from right. the rightly held beliefs, uh, not only as informed from scripture, but those beliefs that the early church held to right. as being right? they concluded that he was a heretic, not simply because his beliefs were different, but because they deviated from what was right. According right. to Wesley, there really is no way to do that today because there are orthodoxies that are all based on your experience with God. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's dangerous. At that point, you don't have Christianity. What you really have are a bunch of little Christianities that everybody can equally claim is orthodox to me. Well, that sounds a whole lot like what people say in the world, my truth. Yep. It can't be, there can't be multiple orthodoxies. There can't be numerous versions of Christianity that, that, are, that are all diametrically opposed to each other. That just can't be true. But Not according to Wesley, it can be true because we have the freedom of believing differently and thinking differently about things that were held as the truth by the early church, according to the word. We have the freedom to move away from that. So according to Wesley, this is big boy stuff. This is, <laughs> this is, this is grown folk kind of talk. And if yeah. you hang with me, it's dangerous now. At least he got that right. It yeah. is dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous.